Good morning, everybody. If we could uh, please uh, take your seats and we'll get started with the opening session. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's great to see uh, all of you here for the 2014 PNCWA Annual Conference. Um, so welcome. Uh, we believe that uh, this year's conference will be the largest conference that PNCWA has ever had. Uh, we are going to have either close to or over 800 participants this year. Uh, last time we were in Vancouver, we actually had 710. So uh, that's a great indication that folks care about uh, clean water and are willing to put some energy into uh, attending and participating in this conference. So thank you so very much all. So we got a great program over the next three days. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from some uh, fantastic speakers in a lot of different um, uh, expertise. Uh, so uh, please take advantage of the folks who have done a lot of hard work in putting their presentations together. A little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, first off, we have a communications task force with the board, uh, just really wanting to know how we communicate uh, between the board and the members of PNCWA. So we have a survey, and if you out in the hallway, PNCWA members can go ahead and take us a survey monkey. We'd like to know how you want uh, us to communicate with you. So we want to know what you have to think, or uh, how you're thinking about uh, communication with you. We really want uh, this event to be fun. Um, it's great to be able to uh, be, get reacquainted with uh, old friends, some of which we haven't seen in uh, decades. Uh, I got the opportunity to do that actually this morning. Um, and to meet new friends and uh, new colleagues. Uh, we also have some great social events and certainly encourage uh, all of you to take advantage of that. Uh, the attendees today uh, or the next three days we have uh, are part of our 26 various uh, committees at PNCWA. So we've got chairman, chair uh, of those committees and also people who participate in those committees. Uh, we have a variety of speakers, uh, PNCWA board members, and certainly the vendors uh, that have some great new products and solutions for all of us that uh, uh, need to solve some tough problems for uh, clean water. And certainly all the active participants that have uh, make this conference a great one. So a special thanks to uh, our opening session sponsors, uh, Global Samson Associates and APSCO. Also want to uh, thank the uh, 14 uh, conference champions which uh, have been scrolling up on the screens. This year uh, I think we set a record for sponsorship at PNCWA. Last year, I think we had two uh, between the tertiary, secondary, and primary sponsors. Last year, we had two. I think this year, we have 13. So thank you, certainly, to our sponsors and, uh, and the help for that. So before I uh, introduce our speakers today, I would like to recognize a couple special guests. Uh, is John Roth um, here at opening session? I'm not sure if John made it this morning. Uh, John Roth is actually with the city of Washougal, and John is the um, liaison between PNCWA and the Pacific Northwest section of AWWA. Uh, this year, AWWA and PNCWA signed a memorandum of understanding really for cooperation, and we're excited about the possibilities of where that may go uh, in the future as we begin that conversation. I also want to uh, recognize uh, Mira Srinivansan. <laughs> Mira is the uh, Washington State winner of the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And so thank you very much for attending. I also want to introduce uh, Linda Kelly with WEF. Linda. And I really, I really like giving Linda a bad time because 
She has the longest title in the world, and I don't have my reading glasses, but you have to use really small font for something this big, but it's the Senior Director Association Engage Engagement and Governance. Is that right? So that takes a lot to get that on just one small business card. So, um, But uh, uh, Linda's going to be talking about the Water Works Initiative with WEF on a national level at our business luncheon. Um, tomorrow, so I'll certainly want to make sure everybody um, is, is, uh, 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 catches that. So our first uh, speaker today is uh, Heath Henderson from Clark County. Uh, he is the Public Works Director, and he actually started with the county as a civil engineer in 1998 uh, before advancing to Environmental Permitting Manager, Design Section Manager, um, and Engineering and Construction Division Manager. Heath oversees 250 employees and a 194 million two-year budget. He is a Washington State professional engineer that also serves as the county engineer. Please welcome Heath Henderson. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I, th I just wanted to welcome everybody here to Vancouver, Clark County this morning. And uh, actually, I thought I'd start off with a little story about how I got kind of involved in, I guess, maybe uh, public works in general and the sewer business, but uh, originally, I'm originally from Maine. Uh, anybody else here from New England area? No, Maine? Oh, okay, I see a few. And, uh, and by the way, I don't know about all these cougars and huskies and ducks and beavers we have out here in the Northwest. We have black bears in Maine, so I think we could take care of uh, all those other animals. But anyway, my first, my first um, when I was a sophomore, I went to the University of Maine when I was a, uh, my sophomore, between my sophomore and junior year, I actually had the opportunity to work for an environmental consulting firm, which I'm pretty sure the only reason I got the job in the first place was because I joined the same fraternity that this other employee joined. But it ended up working out pretty well for me, and I was um, on, I ended up being a sewer inspector on a um, collection system project along the coast of Maine. And the main is, um, the coast is very rocky, so you have to, any, everywhere they put sewer, basically they're just, you, you have the bomb crew ahead of you, you're blasting away. And a lot of the homes that were there, they're, because they wanted to keep the, shallow, the sewer shallow enough, they had, all the connections of the homes were critical. So one of my jobs was basically to go from home to home to home and meet with the actual property owners and get into their basements or crawl space and do some measurements and then take some shots out by the curb to see where we were gonna leave the lateral. And of course, here I was, you know, I was 19 years old and I'm working with all these people who at the time, of course, I had all these old contractors and stuff. I have no experience, I'm clueless. And um, so I'm out there as an inspector basically telling these guys what to do. Are you, you know, did, you have, did you get it in right? Is it wrong? And, so on this one particular day I had, um, there were three different crews running and I was the only inspector on the job. So we had radios, so they had this one critical sewer lateral that was about 100 feet long that I had asked them, hey, before you bury that, please call me, let me know, I'll come right over and I need to get a shot on the, the uh, invert at the end. And so anyway, the day went along and I didn't hear from them. And so I, I finally drove over there and sure enough, it was all covered up. They had already installed it, this 100 foot long pipe. In this particular location, it was critical, you know, one of these critical elevation pieces, because if it was off, it was either, it wasn't gonna flow downhill. And so I, I had to make them pull it up, so it, or dig it up, so they went down, they dug down to this invert, and they took a shot on it, and it was actually laid about a foot the other way. So that they, it, the people there would have flushed their toilet, and too bad. <laughs> So a little bit of victory, victory for me there, and then I went on from there, and then eventually moved out here uh, to the northwest. And actually, right now, and I don't know if, um, people are familiar with uh, in Clark County, we have we have formed what's called the Discovery Clean Water Alliance. And there's a few familiar faces out there. I see Kay Hughes, who is our treatment plant manager, uh, the Salmon Creek treatment plant. I see Tom Burns, who works for our Clark Regional Wastewater District. And uh, actually there's a tour later this week, I think it's on Wednesday, as I believe, of our uh, treatment plant. So certainly uh, would enjoy seeing you out there. Um, but this alliance has basically taken four different agencies, Clark County, the City of Ridgefield, 
the city of Battleground and uh, the Clark Regional Wastewater District and forming one alliance. And so we're all working together on the various systems in Clark County. And it's already, already starting, it actually goes into effect next year. And it, um, it's already shown some positive benefits with various people having input on what's going on in the regional system. So you may hear more about that later this week. But anyway, I have a, you know, a lot of respect for the work that you all do. Um, at, at public works in general, and in particular um, with the clean water effort, working in sewer treatment plants, a lot of the stuff we do, it's buried, it's underground, nobody sees it, nobody sees the good work. They only realize it's there when something goes wrong, you know, and uh, so I definitely um, appreciate what you do, and I would encourage you, my favorite thing about these conferences is uh, just the networking, getting to know people, and uh, finding out what different people are doing, uh, new innovations, so I certainly encourage that, and I also encourage you, there's some fun stuff to do in downtown Vancouver, some nice new pubs to check out, so uh, please enjoy yourself, and uh, welcome to Clark County. So uh, Heath can't uh, stay through the entire uh, presentation or opening session, so if he gets up, it's not because he doesn't like the other speakers. So this, that, or he has an APWA pin on his lapel, and I'm not sure if we could actually let him in, so he's going to hide that. Um, so a lot of what opening session is about is about water quality trading, which is kind of a new uh, topic, and it's even, and it's even broad in its perspective. So I just want to give everybody a little bit of context of, of how we arrived on that for the opening session discussion. So uh, about three years ago, got, or, uh, PNCWA created the Governmental Affairs Committee. And part of the process was to say, you know, a lot of these uh, policy issues take a long time to get through before there's any action on it. And so we kind of went through a process to prioritize those. And one that bubbled to the top was water quality trading. Uh, within the states of Washington, Idaho, and, and Oregon. So uh, this year we actually went back to the fly-in, which is a, an annual event in Washington, D.C., and we actually took an introductory paper for staff and Congress to listen to water quality trading. And they said, we've never heard of that before, and it doesn't sound like it may cost us any money. So that's a really good thing for a legislative uh, tool that folks can use in order to deal with water uh, quality issues within a certain watershed. So they were very, very interested and they said, we'd like to hear more. So we kind of came back to the Northwest and we said, well, let's, um, let's have a better understanding of what that looks like and feels like and also broaden out the conversation. And so we took the opportunity at opening session uh, this year to, uh, to have that better understanding. So concurrently with what the Governmental Affairs Committee was doing in the PNCWA, um, there was a, a workforce for Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, and also the Willamette Partnership and the Freshwater Trust were putting together recommendations for developing water quality trading in the three states. And that recommendation has just literally come out in August of this year. So we were fortunate enough to have two of the individuals that helped develop that recommendation uh, here today. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So, and then following uh, opening, session, opening session, there's also a roundtable discussion at 10.30 in the discovery room, which uh, they'll both be at. So, and that's uh, Helen Bressler and Bobby Cochran. So, and first we're gonna have uh, uh, Bobby Cochran with uh, Willamette Trust, and uh, Bobby is the executive director, excuse me, with uh, Willamette Partnership, uh, which is a nonprofit coalition of business environmental and leaders working to enhance um, the effectiveness of restoration in the Northwest. Willamette Partnership specializes in the design operations of emerging markets for ecosystems, and Bobby has worked on uh, market-based uh, policies for environmental organizations, uh, and also was a collaborator on the multi-state um, or multi-state agency guidelines for water quality trading for Washington, Idaho and uh, Oregon. So please welcome Bobby Cochran. Thank you very much. Well, Mike, thank you very much for having me. And it's, uh, it's really nice to, to be here and see such a big, big crowd. Uh, for Willamette Partnership, for those folks who, who don't know us, 
we're a conservation coalition. Um, you know, our job is not to get water quality trading happening. Our job is to expand the pace, scope, and effectiveness of, of conservation. And I think one of the, the key pieces of, of my background is a lot of my training actually came out of clean water services. So I worked there for five years before I, I landed here at, at Willamette Partnership. And one of the key things that I learned out in Washington County was that water quality is the end product that water quality is reliant on a lot of processes, that if you go upstream to the wastewater plant and you keep following that upstream to streams, land use, hydrology, all of this stuff is connected. And so if you look at the Clean Water Act, it was designed to take care of things like the Cuyahoga River catch and fire, where we had nasty visible problems. And if you look at a lot of our challenges today with water quality, look at temperature, look at nutrients, look at lots of things, that unless we're fixing the underlying ecosystems and investing the hundred millions of dollars in how Mother Nature might have us spend it instead of how the Clean Water Act in 1972 might have us spend it, that we're just never gonna get where we need to go. And so that's kind of as us as a conservation coalition, that's how we got interested in, in water quality trading. And we'll talk about trading and exactly what it is. Um, but the, the basic pieces to us is it's a mechanism to invest in what's really needed to get done to achieve our ecological goals. Um, and water quality trading has been around for a long time. You know, the concepts were originally kind of launched in the 1960s before the Clean Water Act. The theory was that elected bodies are not good at implementing policy. We should let them set goals and then provide flexibility for how you actually implement policy. The first water quality trading programs were happening in Wisconsin in the 1980s. But there has been a really big growth in the last 10, 20 years because as total maximum daily loads have come down, as you have more distributed sources of pollution, as uh, point sources and wastewater facilities are increasing, increasingly facing financial pressure, how do you kind of have more flexibility on how you invest? And the basic gist for water quality trading is a wastewater facility has to reduce a certain amount of pollution. Um, and it can do that itself with really good technology, or it can buy a credit from someone else that goes above and beyond what they have to do. This picture shows a farmer um, installing some no-till and cover crops that could just as easily be another wastewater uh, treatment facility that goes above and beyond their effluent limits and creates a credit. And there's programs like this happening across the country. There's over 25 programs where farmers and wastewater facilities are, are connecting across the country. There's over 13 states that have issued some kind of policy or statement around, around water quality trading. And Idaho, Washington, and Oregon are three of those, three of those states. Um, so a lot of the mechanisms for how trading works are in place. Um, I think a lot of the major challenges that we're having right now is one, just figuring out the kind of the clear legal authority to do it, as well as the fact that it's requiring interactions with lots of different partners. And there's trust issues and risk issues. And that's a big thing that's keeping more folks, I think, from, from trading. As it's, it's not rocket science, but it's also not that easy. But the not easy part is dealing with people. Um, a lot of the science, the financing, and the other pieces are, are in place. Um, this is a picture um, of Fano Creek. Um, it's one of Clean Water Services' first projects. Clean Water Services was one of the first utilities in the Northwest to, to do trading. We have a number of others doing it now. But the basic gist is Clean Water Services had a temperature issue. Um, they could have installed mechanical chillers and cooled the water down. No problem, 100% sure to comply with the Clean Water Act, 100% sure to do almost nothing for fish. Instead, they worked with a lot of different folks to install almost 35 miles of riparian restoration along streams like Fano Creek. This is what it looked like in 2004. It was um, an incised stream, turf grass and invasive species going right down to the edge. In 2007, Clean Water Services re-meandered that stream, and that's what it looked like in 2010. So that's good, right? So Clean Water Services did that at a fraction of the total cost of what it would have cost them to build a mechanical chiller. And you multiply that 35 times over, you're engaging with farmers, you have contracts with nursery owners that are growing native plant nurseries. That is a good thing. And so how do we, how do we get more of that uh, going on? 
And that's a big part of where the conversation's been over the last few years, is how do you take a exa great example like what happened at Clean Water Services and repeat that? City of Medford is doing almost the exact same thing in partnership with Freshwater Trust and other local uh, folks. You have utilities in the Boise River um, actively exploring trading alternatives right now too. Um, and one of the things that we were finding is that trading across all of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, interest was really increasing. And so we sat down with each of the, the state agencies, and we have, um, I think all three state agencies here. Helen is here with Washington Ecology. I saw Michael McIntyre. Mike, can you raise your hand real quick? With Idaho DEQ and Sonia, I don't know if there's other folks here from Oregon DEQ, but if you could raise your hand real quick uh, with Oregon DEQ. Um, we've got a couple folks here. And so basically we sat down with the three state agencies, EPA Region 10, to ask, you know, what do, state, what do the states agree on? What do they not agree on? What are some base recommendations on how water quality trading might roll out in places across the Northwest? And in August, Mike referenced the, the joint statement on water quality trading. Um, and that was released in August. It's basically a result of the states getting together and saying, how you build a water quality trading program? This is kind of how we think it might work. They're just recommendations. Each state is testing it, trying to break it and bend it, see what they hate, see what they, they like. Um, and you have a number of efforts that are going on right now. Idaho is working on updating its Boise River framework and taking another look at its trading guidance. Oregon's announced that it's moving into rulemaking um, and looking at updating its, its guidance on water quality trading. And in Washington, we're, we're talking with, with Helen about pilot opportunities there, but you've got the Washington Conservation Commission and others that are looking at potential sources of demand and opportunities to look at water quality trading in Washington. So you can expect interest in trading across the Northwest to still expand quite a bit, but we're facing some pretty significant challenges from some of our um, environmental friends as, as well, um, kind of asking questions about Water quality trading, as it was originally thought of, was a cheap way to get a cheaper way to get to compliance with an NPDES permit. I think what's really emerged over the last two years is that's not enough. That unless you're articulating about how you're actually going to achieve water quality standards or how you're actually going to get a watershed meeting its overall ecological goals that water quality trading in and of itself is gonna be a difficult conversation. And so I think that's one of the key lessons I wanna make sure that we here in this room is you've gotta be able to articulate collectively how is everybody gonna get water quality improvement in a, in a given watershed, which is hard. I mean, that's not easy. No one has a, a clear recipe book for exactly how that, that happens. But I think that's one of the things, for, certainly for us as well, I'm a partnership that we're, we're really focused on. And I think the other piece of this is nobody has to start from scratch. Um, there's a lot of components in place to help uh, different municipalities start water quality trading right away. Um, and what we're finding as we looked across the country is a lot of that experience is in place but just hasn't been gathered. So we get called about once a year to say, hey, how many people are doing water quality trading in the country? We want to stop having those kinds of conversations. And so one of the other things that we've started is a national network on water quality trading. There's another companion organization called the National Water Quality Trading Alliance. The network is basically working on pulling together national best practices on how water quality trading works. The alliance is actually more of the advocacy side that is actually pushing policies forward on water quality trading around the country. These are the members of the national network. And what the network is going to be producing is not so dissimilar from what the joint recommendations were in the Northwest, but on a national scale, kind of developing specific options and best practices around how you build trading into a permit. What are some of the, the different eligibility requirements? Um, how do you actually you know, confirm that a, a project on the ground is, is meeting what it needs to in order to, to generate a credit? And how do you communicate that? Basically, all of these words are trying to say, if a farmer goes and plants a tree or controls its manure, we're able to quantify that as a pound of phosphorus reduction, just like you might at the end of a pipe at a wastewater facility, and try and create those apples to apples. So as you're making your capital improvement budgets, you can choose apples to apples which way you want to go. So Helen and I will, will, will get into this a, a little later, but these are some of the discussions that we were having at the national level. 
One of the gnarliest questions is this concept of agricultural baseline. So if you're going to buy a credit from a farmer, in theory, that farmer is supposed to reduce their pollution up to a, a level that they're supposed to. And what that level is, is a debate that's tripped people up for decades now. You know, can you just give someone um, a credit for what they're already doing? No. You know, can you give someone a credit for what they're doing now that's totally in compliance? Maybe. Do you have to reduce 30% of what a, a farmer is putting in, uh, sediment that a farmer is putting into a watershed? Maybe you have to do that too. So these are some of the, the, other, the conversations that we're having. One of the other ones is around trading area. You know, do you have to only buy credits upstream from where your, your point source outfall is? You know, if, if you're a city of Boise, that's problematic because there's nobody farming or almost nobody upstream of you. And so you have to be thinking about where in the watershed do you really need to get those ecological benefits? And in a place like the Boise River, almost all of that is downstream. And so having these conversations about how point sources and farmers and other folks interact is, is really key. So I think if you're looking at kind of where water quality trading is going next, you're starting to see a lot of conversation that's moving way beyond the frame of water quality trading, which has traditionally been, I can achieve my compliance at a, at a lower rate, to how do I collaboratively work with the broader community in my watershed to achieve my ecological goals. So for example, we're starting some work that not only is looking at the benefits of planting trees for reducing temperature and stream, but actually the human health benefits of those trees. That if you're planting trees, you're actually filtering uh, air quality, which is shown to have specific benefits for asthma rates and, and other kind of health risk factors. You're combining those with a city parks and trail system that's increasing physical activity. So as you start to think about green infrastructure, not just as your stormwater or your wastewater infrastructure, but it's your health infrastructure, it's your climate resilience infrastructure, that you start to look at some of these packages so it's not just your rate payers that are investing in everything, but you're starting to look at the collection of possible investment for, for where you go. And I think that's one of the things that we're most excited about where water quality uh, trading uh, may, go, may go next. So I'm going to cut myself off here as, as fast as possible to, Mike, are you going to introduce Helen? So Mike can introduce Helen and then Helen can and I can come back up here and kind of discuss a little bit about where trading is going next, too. So thank you. Thank you, Bobby, for that great introduction. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Helen uh, Bressler, which manages the Nonpoint and TMDL program for Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, her staff uh, develops policy direction, uh, for both programs and oversees the works and ensure that the, uh, it meets the requirements of the Clean Water Act. Helen is the author of the Washington Water Quality Trading Offset Framework and is also a collaborator on the same multi-state um, agency guidelines for water quality trading uh, along with Bobby. So uh, without further ado, uh, Helen, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Bobby is a hard act to follow, as you probably can tell. He does this a lot more than I do. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about a regulator's perspective on water quality trading. And the first thing I want to say is that I think it can be a really valuable tool to get us some things that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. I think, however, that one of the things that it also does is it raises a lot of policy questions that I want to be sure people are thinking about when they're thinking about trading. Because um, trading can be really complicated. You saw Bobby's slide about all the things you have to think about. Um, in my job, since I'm the author of the Water Quality of Trading Framework in Washington, I get lots and lots of calls about trading, but they are not from potential buyers. They're from potential sellers who think they're going to make a million dollars by selling you guys credits. And when I talk to them about that they have a responsibility to do some reduction before they are able to earn credits, their interest seems to drop quite a bit. <laughs> Um, so that's the thing to think about when you're an investor in nonpoint trading is exactly what Bobby was talking about, what's the baseline. But I'll get to that in a minute. And the first thing I want to talk about is how simple water quality trading can be. I think people always think it has to be very elaborate. And what I would like to describe is a trading program that we did in Washington based on a 2006 TMDL. 
It was a dissolved oxygen TMDL in the Willapa watershed. And there were five dischargers involved in the TMDL. And this TMDL was pretty much all caused, uh, the problem was caused pretty much by point sources. And there were three fish processors and two municipal treatment plants. And as we started looking at it, we realized that the most sensitive point in the river was below all of them and was affected by all of them. So what we decided we wanted to do is we started calling it a bubble allocation. We wanted to give them a single waste load allocation that they all contributed to and they all had to stay under. And um, when we first started talking to EPA about this, EPA said, well, you can't do that. And we said, well, we really want to do it. We think it's really logical and we're going to do it anyway. And so what we did is we set up the TMDL so there was a single overall waste load allocation for all five. And then we had um, a, a, a equation that described the individual allocation for each one. And they were slightly different because since they weren't in the same place, um, the load from one wasn't necessarily exactly equivalent to the load from another at the sensitive point. So the way the MPDES permits work then that were issued in 2009 is each of them got an individual one that had both their own waste load allocation as an effluent limit and it had the overall. And as long as the overall limit was met, we didn't care what anybody else was doing. And that has ended up working really well in a couple of ways. One way was that two cities involved who hadn't gotten along very well started talking to each other and now they discharge from the same plant. Um, but the other thing is that they have never exceeded the overall limit. So this was a real success, and it was a trading program implemented completely through a TMDL and an MPDES permit. So it was real easy. No credits, you can measure it, easy. Nonpoint is a little more complicated because lots of times with nonpoint you can't measure what the nonpoint reduction is. So you start out with trying to estimate the best you can, you try to figure out how effective this BMP might be, and it gets much more complicated. Even so, though, we have some cities now who have land use authority in Washington who are thinking about how they might use their land use authority to achieve non-point reductions that they could either then trade or try to use so that we don't have to do a TMDL at all. So there's a whole bunch of ways to think about trading. It isn't always about credit accounting, although lots of times it is. It can be all different kinds of stuff. And as Bobby said, you know, part of it is that it's, it's really a new world for people because there's a lot of trust issues when you're thinking about having to have contracts with non-point dischargers you've never worked with. Um, if a non-point trade is tied down in an MPDES permit, the point source still remains responsible if there's an exceedance. So all those things are kind of scary. So I want to talk a little bit about point to non-point trading, which actually I think is probably more interesting. It's one of the ways you can get more ecosystem benefits, but it's also the kind of trading I think that raises a whole lot of questions and are, has consequences that we should be thinking about. So one of the things I want to talk about is TMDLs. Um, when we do a TMDL in Washington, I'm going to talk about Washington's experience. I assume other states do the same. A TMDL, if they're both point source and non-point dischargers, will require reductions from both. So if you're in a TMDL watershed, I'm using TMDL as a verb here, which is kind of weird, but I do. Um, and if you decide you want to trade, because to meet your own waste load allocation is going to be very expensive, and you decide to trade with non-point, if all you get from the non-point is they meet their load reduction, you've only done the non-point part of that TMDL. And eventually, we won't get all the way there that way. And so it will come back onto you. So that's one of the things to think about when you're investing money. Now, there are some situations where that could be a really good idea. For instance, if you're going to expand your plant or you're going to install new technology that you think will come online in 10 or 15 years, it might be a really good idea to do that because that'll buy you the time. But if you're thinking it's going to solve everything, it probably won't. So when we come back to do a TMDL in a few years, you're still going to be on the hook. So one of the things I would like to advocate for is to remember, and Bobby said this at the beginning of his presentation, this is only one tool out of many. And I think that we need to figure out how to use regulatory tools to complement trading in order to get all the way there. In Washington's case, um, the Department of Ecology actually has nonpoint regulatory authority, which we try to use and which I love to use. I've been in charge of the nonpoint program for years, and I'm hoping that by the time I retire, I will actually have cracked the nonpoint nut, but I'm getting a little worried about it because um, it's taken a long time. But um, what I would like to advocate for is that, you know, when, when you're getting squeezed and it looks like really the problem in your watershed is nonpoint, tell your story. Help us out. Um, we did a wonderful 
well, wonderful. We did a very successful um, enforcement action this year or a couple years ago on Nonpoint. It was an agricultural thing and it was pretty bad. We won our case at the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court where it went all the way there. And then at the very next legislative session, um, there was a very concerted attempt to take away our Nonpoint authority. What I would like to say is that if we could help you by doing our nonpoint work, that could possibly be even cheaper than trading because that would be just ecology doing its work. And so what I would say is don't forget that there are other tools. No tool is going to get us all the way there. We have all the farm bill incentive things, we have regulatory tools, and we have trading. And if we use all those in combination, I think we can probably really get there. Not just get the water clean enough to not be on the 303D list, but also get it clean enough so that we have capacity for growth for new industries and new people. And so I think, I, I guess I would like to leave you with just a few thoughts about trading. One of them is only one of the tools. Another is point-to-point -point trading can be really easy and it can be done very simply and very quickly. Um, the other one is um, just, a, just sort of a policy one, which is we need to remember that, you know, we're all connected in these watersheds and that's one of the reasons why we need to work together. And we can't let one sector kind of do whatever it wants and the rest of us continue to pay for it. It really doesn't go along with the idea of the polluter pays, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And the other thing is, I have a little bit of a worry, and we do at the Department of Ecology, about, you know, if we really start paying non-point sources to comply with the law, how are we going to stop? I mean, is that going to be a cost we have to pay forever and ever? And it would be good if we are going to do that. If we decide as a matter of public policy that it's a good idea to pay those people to stop polluting, it would be nice if we could say once we've paid for it, you have to stay that way. So there's some things to think about there. And finally, I think that if we really are able to get the nonpoint people to do their part before they're able to trade, then I think what we buy from them is going to be both durable and credible. And it will, will help trading achieve its true potential, which I think is, is amazing. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Good. You sure? Yeah, we can do it. We're just having a small debate up here, but that's okay. Well, I, I think, Mike, we can just put in the plug for the 10.30, because Helen just raised a whole bunch of stuff that'd be fun to talk about more, but we'll wait till 10.30. Please. No, no, 10, 10.30. Trading panel next door. I think everybody heard that. So, next door, trading panel, 10.30. Be there. Okay. Uh, thank you both, Bobby and Helen. That was uh, uh, awesome on quality trading. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Sandra Ralston from uh, WEF, and Sandra is the immediate past president of the uh, of WEF and associate vice president with Ar Arcadis in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she has served as chair of the WEF Governmental Affairs Committee from 2005 and 2008, uh, with particular focus on, cre on increasing outreach to member associations. Um, Governmental Affairs Committee is con and conducting national discussion on what the next 35 years of the Clean Water Act should be. Uh, so Sandra is going to give us an update on uh, what's happening at WEF. So again, welcome uh, Sandra Ralston. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I also want to thank the uh, Board of Trustees and everyone that I've met so far because I've been, uh, I've been really quite well treated and it's really been uh, a delight to be here. Um, I look forward to coming here because uh, the PNCWA is one of the leading partners with the Water Environment Federation in serving water quality mission. And you've actually contributed a number of leaders to WEF, uh, Presidents uh, Michael Reed, Adam Zabinski, Jim Clark, as well as the uh, trustees that I've served on the board with, Ron Moeller and Paul Schuler. So thank you very much for giving us those leaders. They, they really did a, a terrific job representing you and, and the whole industry. So they are all different, but they are all passionate about the mission of water quality, which I'm sure that you are all as well. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be spending your, your time here for the next couple of days. So I know that you all do different work, 
We all do different work in water quality. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to being viewed in our communities as first responders, as protectors of public health, and preserving the environment. And it's a, it's a, a terrific responsibility in your communities, and it's a job that is not always easy to do. And looking ahead in the future, it's a job that it's going to become even probably a bit more challenging because what we're looking at in terms of the pressures of climate change, extreme weather, aging infrastructure, the population growth, which is going to increase the uh, waste loads coming through our systems and to our plants, and just the whole idea of, of, of public support trying to deal with the aging infrastructure that we have. So, Business as usual is probably not going to work. Uh, we're going to have to actually take a look at what are the new ways that we can do things, what are our new approaches, and we're going to have to really embrace that change and really be creative. And I know as WEF has looked at what do we need to do to continue our mission, how do we deliver this bold leadership, we're also looking at, at how we change. And, and our roadmap to the future, our change is built actually around the three critical objectives from our strategic plan. And that's driving innovation in the water sector, it's enriching expertise of professionals, and it's also raising awareness of the value of water. So I want to talk first about uh, innovation, because there's really some very exciting stuff going on in, in innovation. Uh, and it's technologies as, as well as practices. I think the discussion that we've just had, and you're going to have again at 10.30, on water quality training is a really innovative approach you know, to dealing with water quality. And a lot of what we're talking about now that's exciting in WEF, I think, and in the industry with innovation, deals with resource recovery. And this is just, let's, if, you were, if you were a corporate PR flax, we'd call it rebranding. You know, but it's taking a look at the fact that we are not in waste water treatment. We are in water resource recovery because we are dealing with a substance that's going to deliver new treated water. It's going to capture energy and it's going to capture nutrients, all, all valuable resources. So, let me just give a couple of examples of, of what WEF is doing in the way of resource recovery. For one thing, um, I don't know whether you've noticed, but if you look at any of the WEF publications, if you look at WENR, if you look at Journal, if you look at anything, you will not find the phrase wastewater treatment plant anymore. You will find water resources recovery facility. And that's just to continue to drive home to us and to the public the value of what we do and how we are contributing to the value change. So one of the things we've dealt with is energy. Um, we did several years ago an energy roadmap that was directed at helping facilities go from being energy consumers to being energy neutral and then even energy positive. You know, there are certain examples of um, Facilities, uh, East Bay Mud in Oakland, California is an example of one that's actually selling back into the grid, and, and there are others. Uh, so in addition to the uh, roadmap, we've also had a number of conferences. We'll have one in June in Washington, D.C. on energy and water. And I think actually uh, Wednesday the 29th, there is a webcast uh, sponsored by the Water Environment Research Foundation and WEF on going to energy neutral. I think another, uh, another exciting area is nutrient management and recovery. Uh, similar to what we did with energy, WEF has actually just put out um, a nutrient guidebook that talks about how to manage nutrients, not just for compliance, but also how you go about making that into a, you know, a revenue generating uh, source for yourself. And I think there are some really good examples right here. Uh, in this area, I know Clean Water Services is harvesting uh, phosphate, as is uh, the city of Boise. So they're pulling it out of it, of, out, of their, out of their waste stream, and they're actually making it into a product, you know, which, which the world, by the way, needs because our phosphorus supplies are declining. So um, I think another good thing about both of those is that they're using public-private partnerships to actually fund and make that possible. And I think that's also a growing trend that we're going to see more is just because of 
the funding situation, we're going to have to be a little bit more creative about how we fund that. Um, I think also another project of note with clean water services, the fact that they're doing nitrification through a wetlands. So that natural system, you know, is not using energy and it, it is also not contributing to greenhouse gases, you know, certainly in comparison to what a traditional nitrification process would do. So let's look at another um, you know, in innovation area for WEF, and that's stormwater. And uh, stormwater has, whoops, right away, let's go back. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about LIFT. Um, and LIFT is a partnership between WEF and the Water Environment Research Foundation. And the whole thing is geared toward uh, eliminating or certainly reducing the barriers to innovation that we find. You know, the, the barriers to innovation uh, arise certainly from uh, the regulatory arena. I mean, I think we just heard in, in the discussion of the water quality trading, you know, that there are, there are a lot of issues that have to be dealt with to make sure that we are in fact doing compliance. So we're also a risk adverse industry. You know, we are responsible for public health. We're responsible for, you know, environmental preservation. So it's not easy to step out there and, and take risks on unknown technologies. So the whole idea of the partnership is actually to put demonstration projects together with utilities that have a need for something that they want to try, that, that if it's phosphorus reduction, if it's energy management, with a technology provider that's got something new that's really untried and to do demonstration projects. And WEF's role in this is to actually provide the communication, to provide the information dissemination, and then also really importantly, we're supposed to be expanding the regulatory space to make this possible by, by working with EPA and having a dialogue with them to make it easier to do innovation. Um, I think it was noteworthy that uh, WEF hosted the US EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy, at WEF Tech, and she was very present you know, she did an address and talked about uh, WEF's mandate for, or uh, EPA's mandate for resiliency and how that needed to be, you know, worked into innovation. And she also met with some utility managers at breakfast and asked them questions about, you know, what were their challenges and, and what did they find difficult to do. And um, she took notes. And she said at the end that she was going to be talking with her staff about what to do. And I, I really believe that she will do that. I also think that turning the EPA is probably a bit like steering the Queen Mary. So I'm not going to you know, expect anything right away. But I think that she really is serious about helping reduce those barriers to innovation just as WEF is. So now we get to stormwater. Uh, stormwater is something that has really in the last couple of years become um, really of interest to WEF members and non-members. And what we've found is that there seems to be a need for a national organization to really be a home to a lot of the stormwater, a lot of the stormwater groups, a lot of the stormwater associations, just to help network, to work on advocacy, and to do programs. So that's what WEF is, is working on, in addition to doing the publishing the stormwater management magazine, as well as pulling out the, the, the monthly uh, bulletins on stormwater. And we've also recently gotten a grant from US EPA to help work on uh, doing uh, green infrastructure awards. And we're also going to be doing standards for stormwater. There are really no standards right now for stormwater practices and stormwater technology. So that's something that WEF has taken on, and I think that will really contribute to the industry. So the next, the second objective is global expertise. And this is really where WEF spends most of its resources uh, and most of its programming, and that is in education and training of our members. So we do publications, we do conferences, we do webcasts. We have just an, an enormous amount of um, content that's directed at what is, what is the member, what is the operator, what does the utility manager really need to do a good professional job. So um, among that is a growing online service for continuing education. So you can go online, you can take a look at a lot of the courses, take the courses and actually earn CEUs online from a lot of the WEF content. And certainly the premier event um, that we have in terms of, of education and training is WEF Tech. So how many of you were at WEF Tech? 
Ah, okay, good. Well, I, you know, I think that you probably saw them, and they're just, you know, an enorm enormous number of tracks and presentations and a huge exhibit floor. I mean, it just offers an all, uh, you know, tremendous amount for the education and training of professionals. So I would encourage you, if you can, you know, to go to Chicago next fall, uh, where WEF Tech 2015 will be taking place. And an important part of our global expertise is the operator strategy. So WEF has had a task force. We've worked with the House of Delegates. Uh, we've worked with some committees to actually take a look at how can we increase the profession? How can we increase um, the national certification, the reciprocity, education training, and then importantly, delivery? Because WEF is going to work a lot on content, on coordinating and making it possible. But in terms of delivery, member associations, you know, the um, PNCWA and, and your uh, fellow member associations are really where it happens. That's where, the, that's where the actual training takes place. So one of the things we've been looking at is the operator of the future strategy. So if we're going to have the utility of the future, it's clear that we're going to have to have an operator of the future that's actually trained, that's actually certified to be able to do the technologies that we have, whether it's doing stormwater treatment centers, whether it's doing deammonification, a lot of the things are going to be necessary. So WEF is taking a look at what is that body of knowledge and then how is it going to be delivered to actually help the operator. So the third um, critical objective is adequacy. And this really breaks into two parts. Uh, it breaks into legislative policy. Uh, and one of, I think, the best things, and Mike actually mentioned it earlier, was um, of a, an event that we have um, that we call Water Week. We're starting to call it Water Week. It's also called the Fly-In. But it's an opportunity for all members' associations to visit, to hear uh, presentations by congressional staff, by EPA, and to actually you know, get a message together to go up on the Hill and talk to legislative offices about what is really important to you. And we had a good discussion at the board meeting yesterday about how to make that more effective in terms of messaging. And so there were some good ideas from your board about having you know, some webcasts and conference calls well in advance so that, so that people come to Washington with the messages and in fact can communicate them in advance to their uh, legislative offices, just as Mike said you, know, you did last year with water quality trading. So that will be in April. I, ho I hope that you will be participating again. I think that you will. So one of the other things that we're doing in advocacy is we are a member of the Value of Water Coalition. This is actually an industry coalition. It's made up of a number of major associations, WEF, um, AWWA, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, for example, as well as private companies, uh, private water companies uh, and technology providers. The whole idea was to try and come together and do this, uh, the one voice of water, the one message that's actually going to affect people's support for what we need to do and, and the money and the funds that we need in terms of preparing our infrastructure and making that leap into the future to do that. So it has been an ongoing, ongoing effort and uh, it's not easy to keep all of those associations together on, on one page, but I think that it's been very successful. And the result of it, and one of the results of it, has been um, a national uh, report uh, that was published by the Water Environment Research Foundation and the Water Research Foundation. And it's, it actually studies what is the impact of water investment on the economy and on jobs. And what they found were some really, I think, um, statistics that we've all known anecdotally, but they've actually uh, quantified them. And what they found was that the um, money that you invest, that we all invest, that your communities invest in water infrastructure returns over two times in terms of economic return. And it's also a tremendous job creator. Um, the 30 utilities that they surveyed for this report, which represent I think about 83 million people, over the next 10 years are going to be investing $233 billion in new capital funds. And the return to the, to the economy that's expected is more on the order of $550 billion. So you can get that kind of return, plus the fact that they're going to be providing 289,000 jobs every year. So you know, when we, when we talk to congressmen, when we talk to um, our town council, 
about why we invest in infrastructure, you know, it is certainly about public health and it's certainly about environment, but it's also about what returns to the community in terms of jobs and economic value. So we have launched a new campaign based on this and based on the past work that the Value of Water Coalition has done and it's called Water Works. And those of you who went to WEFTEC probably saw the messaging, saw the banners um, that were hanging there that are really, um, you know, I think going to capture, hopefully, um, a lot of the important points that we have. WEF is also going to be working with member associations on putting together a toolkit so that you can all localize those messages. And then Linda's gonna be talking about that uh, tomorrow at the business luncheon. And um, I think, uh, I hope that you'll all be there because I think you'll really get excited about what it is that, what it is that you can do. So I've hit some of the highlights uh, of what WEF is doing to help you continue to, make, to meet your mission, missions as you go forward and, and face these challenges. So, you know, you do such, you do such important work. Um, and at the end, you know, WEF is going to do what we can and we're going to partner with um, PN, CWA, and they're gonna do what they do, but it's really all gonna fall as it always does, you know, on you to fulfill that mission of water quality and I hope as you go forward, you'll be able to take something from this, use some of these WEF resources as you do your jobs. And I just want to thank you for your attention and also thank you very much for the job that you do. It is so very important. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And now I'd like to have Steve James, who is the chair of the scholarship committee, come up. Thank you. Good morning. How many of you are parents? How many of you work with somebody who's going to retire in the next five years? How many of you use water? <laughs> Come on. Hey, if you raise your hand, any of those scholarship is for you. And uh, we've got a lot to celebrate this year. We've had a lot of fun. I'd like to start out, though, by introducing our scholarship winners. And we've got a great group this year. I'd like to start with Craig Fairbaugh. He's a, um, a student right now at Portland State University. Craig, if you could come up. Um, and Craig has, he's on the President's Dean list, President's Dean's list. He's worked with Engineers Without Borders, and he's got a passion for watersheds and teaching the next generation. Please help me congratulate Craig. Our second recipient is Kaylee Ierly. She's at OSU, and she's one of our first, um, first year uh, scholarship winners. And I'd like to have her, the first generation come up to receive that. Is uh, Greg Ierly here? Yep. Great. So Kaylee has been a hospital volunteer, is at OSU Honors College. I want to read a quote that she's got, and there's a great poster that shows this. But she says, there will never be another drop of water created. We must preserve and clean the water we have. I think that says it all. Thank you, Dan. And our third recipient is Jason Mellon. He's from the University of Idaho. Uh, he graduates December of next year. He's a um, PNCWA and WEF member. And I think he's been doing a lot of things that we all appreciate. We talked about wastewater reclamation, resource recovery. He's got a passion for using uh, biological phosphorus removal to generate products that not only pay for the process, but help replace other carbon products. Jason, if you could come up. So what makes all this possible? You guys and your donations have made all this happen. Um, I'd like to start by talking about some pretty spectacular donations we've gotten. This year we have our single biggest donation. The Umpqua Basin Operator Section, UBOS, gave us $3,000 for the scholarship fund. I'd like to give them a hand for that. Thank you. The North Idaho Operators Section also gave $1,000 from their annual conference. So a quick hand for them, too. 
And then we've had Cascade Energy and JUB Engineers both gave 500. So as a group, we're all elevating that bar. Now we've added a couple events. Last year, Preston Van Meter ran the golf tournament. This year, Aaron Kraft ran with that, and we had a great outing yesterday, along with a fun run. If you guys missed that, you want to put it on your calendar next year, because it's really a great time. We had sun, we had rain, we had good friends. It was all perfect. Um, that was on Sunday, and that'll probably be next year also. You still have an opportunity to participate, though. There are two great things coming up, and I know you feel like you've missed out so far. But We've got a silent auction, and that starts right after this inter uh, the opening session and goes until 6.30 on Tuesday. We'd love to have you bid on items. A lot of people have donated. If you can go after that, there's some great stuff there. We also have a 50-50 raffle, and those of you who know Adam Zabinski know that he's not going to give you much rest. Um, but if you can buy the raffle ticket and we get them all sold out, then we go on with the rest of the conference. The great thing about the 50-50 raffle is you get half the money back. So whoever wins that gets up to $1,000. So it's definitely worth your while. Um, and then individual donations. If you've got something you'd like to give, you don't want to buy something, but would like to just give cash, we take that too. We're pretty easy. So I'd like to thank, I'd like to mention two final things. One is um, I'm going to be transitioning off as a scholarship chair. Aaron Croft will be the new scholarship chair, and that's very exciting. I'd like to thank Aaron for doing that. And then one final thing, something near and dear to my heart. This year, we didn't have any applications from two-year um, college students. We didn't get any operators that applied for the scholarship. We really want to help sponsor that. So if you know somebody that's an operator, wants to be an operator in a two-year program, please have them apply next year. It's very important to us that we get that spread around. So thank you very much for everything you've done. And uh, you still have some other opportunities. Thank you, Steve. Um, so, Mr. Poling, if you'd come up and talk about Water for People. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm standing in for uh, Irene uh, Wall, and uh, Ed and I have been splitting the duties uh, uh, here for Irene for a little bit. So. I want to tell you about the raffle that we have. Um, we have the uh, uh, wine for water raffle. How many of you have uh, participated in the past in the raffle? How many have won the wine? Yes, it's yes. And, and so I'm going to give you two reasons why you should buy raffle tickets. So the one I'm going to appeal to your uh, sense of uh, boy, I would love to win a great bottle of wine. And I can tell you this list is incredible. I don't think there's anything on there that's like less than a $25 bottle. That's sort of like the low bar. And some people, many people, have been very generous and given us uh, some some things from their sellers approaching $100 a bottle, some and, and even more. So so that's the reason you should buy raffle tickets today. Now, when you come to the business lunch tomorrow, we have a speaker who has done Water for People projects, who's been on the ground and seen the good work that Water for People does. So you're going to buy tickets today in order to win one of those great bottles of wine, and you'll buy tickets tomorrow for the great work that it does providing water and sanitation uh, for, the, for people around the world. So thank you very much. Funny, you have to seem to adjust that microphone after Mark gets up here. I don't know what the issue is. Um, lastly, I'd like to actually introduce uh, our conference chairman for uh, 2014. And uh, this gentleman, I actually met, I think, about 25 years ago, and he was an intern in college, and he was uh, sporting around with a nuclear densometer, uh, taking some uh, density tests out on a road job that we were together with in Kitsap County. So. Uh, now he runs the uh, uh, water division in, for Tetra Tech in the Seattle area. I'd like to introduce Kevin Dewar. Thank you, Mike. Um, I just have a couple of announcements. We're all really happy that everyone's here and that um, it's uh, starting off to be a very good uh, conference. Um, a few things on the technical program, um, as uh, uh, Mike had and, um, the, and uh, Helen had alluded to, we have a water quality trading panel 
uh, starting right away. That's session number two. It starts at 10.30 and goes until noon. Uh, tomorrow we also have a panel on stormwater. That's session number nine, and that starts at eight, and that goes until 9.30. Uh, also, we have a poster session this year. So there's gonna be posters on the second floor um, starting after lunch today and uh, going through the break um, at 3.45. And then tomorrow morning, uh, after the break, there's going to be a CEU roundtable uh, for any of you who would like to listen and ask questions of the representatives from the uh, state agencies in charge of wastewater certification. That's in uh, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, that'll be a 45-minute session, and that starts at 10.30 tomorrow um, in the Birch Room on the second floor. Uh, there'll be no CEUs for you to attend. However, uh, it's information only. Uh, and I think it's a session if you're interested and you, you should go to, to listen. Uh, there has also been some changes to the schedule. So uh, if you had received any uh, schedule that came to you ahead of time, I recommend just checking the schedule that you got um, at registration today in the booklet. That's got the uh, most current schedule. Um, as far as other housekeeping items, uh, if you have a complete package registration, you get all the meals. Uh, there's a fact sheet in there in every registration packet that'll tell you, based upon your registration, what you're getting um, uh, as far as meals are concerned. If you pre-purchase tickets, those should have been inside of your packet when you uh, picked up your packet. Um, as far as drawings go, uh, in your, um, in your uh, uh, packet, there's a card and there's um, outside vendors and hallway vendors. If you go and visit those, if you get at least four stamps on your card, uh, you can drop that card into a drawing and, uh, and, and win up to um, uh, $100. However, it's very important, make sure you put your name on the card before you drop it in. I don't think there's any uh, line on there, so please remember to do that. Uh, please make sure you, you do visit our vendors. It's very easy to uh, go to the hallway and outdoor vendors. Uh, it's uh, very well marked from the exhibit hall. Uh, our our, our um, PNCWA Safety and Occupational Health Committee is uh, promoting safety this year. Uh, they are selling buttons for $2 each that have safety slogans on them. Uh, when you buy them, you will get um, a, a, a chance for um, a $50 Best Buy gift card. So uh, please buy those, uh, those safety buttons. Um, all drawing winners will be posted by Wednesday morning um, at the break. If you are not here, uh, winnings will be mailed to you. Uh, and then finally, some other um, um, things to, to, to uh, announce. Uh, after the technical session, um, there's going to be a, um, ex there's going to be an open, there's going to be a reception between five and seven. And uh, tomorrow night after the technical session, I'll come back to the exhibit floor for a uh, vendor-sponsored local beer and wine tasting reception. And finally, there's a PNCWA member survey. There's a computer set up in the lobby. Um, and I think you can uh, use those computers to fill out surveys. Uh, please take a few minutes, uh, members only, to take the survey. It will help determine what improvements PNCWA can do. And then finally, the operator's challenge. We're set up over here for the operator's challenge. Uh, please spend some time to go over and check it out. It starts right after the opening session. Um, I'd also encourage you to go over there probably as soon as possible because Mike and Nan will be <laughs> working with staff to get this area cleared up for, um, uh, for our uh, lunch. Anyway, welcome. Uh, please enjoy, and we're glad that you all are here. Thank you. I believe that's it. Again, uh, have a great conference and thank you all for attending.